Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 72 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. And today we are joined by the lovely Dr. Jason Wysocki. This is his third interview with me and we're going to be talking all about structural integration and the importance of it when you are dealing with a condition like SIBO. So things like why do we need to be considering the way our body is held, both from an external structure and also what's going on internally. And this is a topic that's really close to my heart because I have discovered through this whole crazy SIBO journey that I am full of adhesions and scar tissue and my intestines and organs are really compromised in the way that they're sitting within my body. So it's no wonder that I developed SIBO and it's no wonder I have relapsed with my SIBO because I will continue to do so until I have addressed my adhesions and the fact that the structure or the integrity of the way my body is held is compromised. So we talk about what structural integration is, when we should use it, and how Dr. Jason Wysocki looks at a person's body from feet to head and how he works with them to... Uh, go through a really easy to understand process to address this in their bodies. So I know you're going to find this absolutely fascinating. I always enjoy sitting down to chat with him. Now, before we get stuck into today's interview, I wanted to remind you that I'm running a massive site-wide sale on my brand new and shiny and lovely website. It's really to say thanks to you for being there with me over the last couple of years. I have a new website that I hope will give you a much better experience when you come and visit me at thehealthygut.com. And to celebrate the launch, we are offering 20% off everything on the site. So head to thehealthygut.com and you just need to enter new site 20 in the coupon code when you go into the store and you will get 20% off absolutely everything you buy. So why not grab some of my cookbooks? You could use one of my SIBO meal plans. I've got my SIBO shopping tours. You could even sign up for the SIBO coaching program or a one-on-one call with me and they are all 20% off. But hurry, this sale does end soon. And it wraps up on Sunday, the 26th of August at 11.59pm. That's Pacific time in the US. So head to thehealthygut.com and you will be able to get 20% off everything. And finally, before we start the interview today, don't forget that if you would like to get the full transcription from today's episode and all of the season two podcast episodes on the Healthy Gut podcast, you can do so absolutely free. All you need to do is join up as a podcast member and you just need to put your name and email address in. And that means I can email you the transcription of the show when it becomes available. So I'd love to have you join as a member of the Healthy Gut podcast. I love sharing the transcriptions with you. It means you can read along to the interview, make notes, take it along to your doctor. Um, It really can help you with your own journey to recover your health. And the Healthy Gut podcast members also get first access to exclusive content and specials and promotions. So that's a little bit of extra special thank you from me to you to say thanks for being a member of the podcast. So without further ado, let's head into the interview with Dr. Jason Wysocki from Eight Hearts in Portland, Oregon in the United States, where we talk all about structural integration and SIBO. Dr. Jason Wysocki, thanks so much for returning to the Healthy Gut podcast today. It's my pleasure, Rebecca. 
I've had the great honour of having you on to the Healthy Gut Podcast twice in season one and I do recommend that if you haven't already listened to those interviews, you go check them out and they're in the show notes, uh, links to them are in the sh- show notes. Today we're going to talk about structural integration. It's a topic that you are passionate about, it's something that you have integrated into your own practice and uh, and I'm really interested to talk about what it is and why those of us with digestive issues such as SIBO should be thinking about whether something like structural integration could be part of the mix of treatment that we could consider doing. So why let's let's sort of start at the start and your approach to how you even uh, started integrating uh, structural integration into your practice. Yeah. So Rebecca, the structural integration piece uh, came about because I'm constantly searching for ways to look at the body in a whole holistic, vitalistic manner, and really what sparked this journey for me was coming to the place where certain treatments, the best of science, might not have worked. You know, they they did some good, but didn't get us to the place and the destination where we wanted to go. So in that interim, I asked questions and, and looked and continued to learn uh, and found something from my previous training back way into naturopathic school from Dr. Sandberg Lewis and really expounded upon it and got further training and got the work myself and started to uh, go through two or three years of this training and then started to incorporate that in my practice and really saw that this piece started to make a difference for some of my chronic patients which made me start to think should this be earlier in the treatment and what might kind of send a signal that this may be needed and I'm sure we'll talk more about that but uh, the journey to this was really from uh, just my patients who I learned from every day getting to a place where we wanted and needed something else and this was a piece of my answer of course I find myself on this journey too and I'm still asking questions But uh, at this point, this was a piece of my answer. And I've really seen in incorporating this in my work myself, uh, things really change. And you mentioned that this has um, been really beneficial for some of your chronic patients. Are they the people who have done the rounds of herbs, the rounds of antibiotics, uh, potentially even the elemental diet, and they're not feeling better? Uh, and I'd like to also talk about whether you look at their breath test results as a, as a major marker of whether it's successful or all these treatments are failing or whether you just go by their symptoms um, or both? Probably a both and. And, um, you know, the, the breath test, let's start on that because you mentioned that last. That's what I remember right now. So the breath test uh, really I use when I'm confused. Uh, It's diagnostic in the beginning. It really tells us what levels of gases there may be, where those things are, and gives us a direction. Uh, I don't use it again in my practice until I'm confused, until I want to see whether something has failed or succeeded or we need a different direction. And you're exactly right. This is after probably multiple rounds of whatever treatment we may decide for the particular patient in their circumstance and their resources. Um, And that's where structural integration came in was this was most likely after multiple rounds of everything, possibly a lot of different practitioners as well, all well-meaning, all part of this journey and has brought me to this place and the patient to this place. Um, You mentioned kind of looking at the breath test as a barometer. And I think, it's, I think it's excellent information, but there may come a time in treatment when someone really doesn't have much digestive distress anymore. And their symptoms on that level of things is quite better. But yet the breath test could actually be higher than any time. We see this a lot. Uh, it's kind of the Wizard of Oz thing, smoke and mirrors behind it. And it it doesn't mean anything other than it's just measuring where that person is at that moment in time. And what really matters to me and treatment is how someone feels and interacts with their world and moves things through. So if, if someone's succeeding on those levels, 
I see that a little bit higher than a lab, which is just a picture in time. However, it is very useful, so I want to be careful to respect that. Uh, it's something that I've experienced myself with my relapse with SIBO. Um, my numbers are higher than they were the first time around with SIBO, yet my symptoms are significantly lower. And the only time I really had quite noticeable, noticeable symptoms was over Christmas, uh, Christmas of 2017. And I was staying at my in-laws and there was a lot of gluten, dairy, sugar, alcohol, the foods that I don't generally eat very much of in my day-to-day life. And so I was bloated and constipated and just feeling a bit groggy in the mornings. And I knew that, that, that I suspected I should say, that my, my SIBO had returned and the breath test confirmed that. But since getting back into my normal world, my normal way of eating, which is a very healthy way of eating, um, predominantly gluten-free, um, low sugar, low alcohol, my symptoms aren't, aren't there. So even though my bacteria is higher, I feel fine. So I think it's um, if I just went off my breath test results, I could be worrying unnecessarily. I could have a lot of anxiety unnecessarily because I would be thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so sick, but I'm, I'm not feeling sick. So I'm using those breath test results really as a moment in time. Okay, that's interesting. Let's look at why my small intestine has allowed the bacteria to overgrow again and look beyond just doing rounds of antimicrobials and, uh, and various uh, treatment options, which is why we're here today talking about these other options that are available to us to consider. Exactly. And that's, that's that answer and that place where, you know, I found myself and I found myself with my patients in the sense of what does this mean? You know, obviously we put faith and stock in the breath test. We use it as a diagnostic tool. So it tells us something about the, the level of bacteria in your small intestine, but that has to be correlated with your symptoms. And there is t- there are times in treatment that if you chose to go through another antimicrobial protocol, that may change things and not necessarily for the better. You know, or choose to do another round of elemental diet or do an extra week based on a breath test. And and sometimes that's the right choice, and other times it's not. Each of those each of those choices uh, should be made by a bunch of different variables, and the bunch of different variables is looking at okay, well, this these particular symptoms are better your digestive symptoms, but this other area still needs to move through, and and that's kind of that piece that we're discussing today is how do we start moving that other stuff quote unquote through. And for me, it was really interesting, um, my approach to this second round diagnosis versus the original. The original, I was just hell bent on getting the clear diagnosis as quickly as possible. I wanted to be told I just needed to take some pills and be done with it. I was willing to modify my diet, but only for a short period of time. And um, I just wanted the easy solution. I didn't look beyond the small intestine. I didn't look at myself structurally to understand why my small intestine was failing to work properly. Whereas this time around, I am looking at that and I um, uh, am working with Alyssa Tate who does visceral mobilization uh, because I've since learned that I am so adhered and stuck together internally um, in my, in my abdominal cavity and in other parts of my body. So structurally, I am not w- aligned to facilitate easy movement or flow through my body. And I wish I had known this from the start because I look back and I think, well, imagine what I could have achieved in the last three and a half years since that original diagnosis. But I also acknowledge that sometimes this is a journey and we can't know everything at the start. Sometimes we have to come to it. And would I have been open or willing to do this work back then? 
possibly not because I would have said, no, just give me the tablets. I just want to take them. Uh, so sometimes it can take us time to get here. But I think it's important that uh, with a condition like SIBO, I really see SIBO as this secondary thing. It's a symptom of something going wrong. It's not a diagnosis in itself. It's really the body saying, hey, human out there, I'm not working properly. Please help me. This is just a, a signal to you to say things aren't working. I need you to, I need you to tune in and, and help me flow better. So I guess that's where structural integration comes in. So let's talk about what it actually is. Yes. So really simply, structural integration is based on the work of Ida Ralph. Uh, she was a PhD biochemist in the 40s, so amazing woman that she was able to reach those heights in the academic and medical world at that point. And she worked on this element called fascia, which is a new buzz phrase. A lot of convention, even conventional medicine is really starting to look at fascia, especially uh, chiropractors and PTs and visceral manipulation and all these sorts of things. So it's based on her work of coming up with something called 10 sessions. And that's basic to the work in the sense that each of these sessions has a specific part of the body we're working on, a specific uh, area of fascia, and a specific purpose. There's also the spirit behind those sessions, and they do different things, and we'll go through them. Um, but that, that work defined is pretty much on the fascial plane. And interestingly enough, fascia is this piece that goes through our entire body. The more we learn about it, the more we see it around different bones and different muscles and different structures and in the abdominal cavity and through it and in the psoas and through our core and up into our head. And there's even little fibers that go into our cells. So the fascial network literally encompasses the majority of what is called the interstitium of our body, the in-between. So it's this place that everything has to move through. So talk about nerves, talk about blood, talk about energy, talk about all those things has to flow through this medium. And I know that I'm speaking big and complex, so there was two, two, two things that in my learning that I was able to understand this concept of fascia a little better. Uh, the first was, because I have deboned a chicken, it literally is, as you take apart that leg and thigh and rip it away from the thorax, it's that clear gelatinous stuff that you just have to peel away. And it's very, very sticky, and it's very, very intertwined in there. Unfortunately, in medicine, we dissect uh, preserved cadavers. So when we th went through medical school, we dissect preserved cadavers, and the fascia literally just sinks once, once, a, once a, um, a human actually passes away, the fascia just kind of, a, after it's preserved, it just kind of loses its elasticity. So it's not very plentiful, same as a chicken. In a cadaver that has not been preserved, which fascial work is done on, this is through everything. And surgeons deal with this a lot, where they have to kind of go in and deal with a joint. They're just removing and piecing that through, but it's very complicated. So fascial work, I believe, is a wave of the future in the sense of uh, figuring out why something, even though it should be working, is not and not moving through. It's a great analogy for the digestive system in the sense of if the fascial system isn't moving, how could we expect the digestive system to move and do what it's supposed to? So structural integration is this way of ordering the practitioner and movement in a certain 10 sessions to start someone being aligned and integrated in gravity to move through their fascial plane. And structural integration isn't the only system that does this. Uh, Chinese medicine refers to probably the fascial network as the San Zhao or the triple warmer. So there's multiple planes that we can work on this with, but structural integration was what uh, I started to kind of explore. Mm, it's interesting. I'm wondering if uh, one of your kind of alert systems would be a patient that would say, oh, my migrating motor complex just doesn't feel like it works or I'm chronically constipated or I, 
I've done the sesame seed test where I timed the, the time I ate the sesames and the time I pooped out polka dot poop uh, and it was days and days and days and, and everything feels really slow. Is that a, a bit of an alert system to you around hmm, what's going on with their fascia? What's, what's preventing the uh, migrating motor complex or the peristalsis to really work efficiently or appropriately in the intestinal um, system and the that whole digestive process. Absolutely. So I have several patients now that we literally did the best SIBO treatments we knew. We even mixed some. We used everything we possibly could throw at things, found the best prokinetics, both pharmaceutical and herbal, and sometimes even mixed them. And there was still, you know, this this level of not moving, stuck, call it constipation, not moving, all of these things. Um, We started working with structural integration. Those patients aren't constipated any longer. And we didn't change treatment, So, but we did the treatment, so I can't completely discount that. We used the best of that side of things, but it was this piece that finally got them moving through that area of their body. Consequently, the other side you know, maybe a diarrheal case where there's, quote unquote, maybe too fast of a migrating motor complex that needs to be kind of ordered or a dysfunctional one. It just works at the wrong times. That's the focus. That's what I love about this work is it's not necessarily just to move faster. It also can help move slower. It's, it's more, it's more what we would call an adaptogenic process. That's what we call herbs that both can increase or decrease depending on what the body's doing. This is an adaptogenic process in the sense of if it's not moving at all, it helps it move and move in an orderly way. If it's moving too fast, it slows it down and helps it move in an orderly way. So other things from just that patients would say that would clue me in to what what, what should we look into this? Should we even discuss this? Should we kind of venture down this rabbit hole? Uh, would be, I have this part of my body that doesn't move, wherever it may be, in the abdominal tract or somewhere else that just it hasn't moved. It hasn't moved for 10 years. I can't move through it. Or this part of my abdomen, I feel something and it just, nothing moves through it or something moves through slow in that area or it just, it feels wrong. Or this is the, the right side by my hip. It just, it's stuck. You know, those sorts of things really clue me in. Or one of the big ones, and this might be surprising, I just can't take a deep breath in. Or I can't extend my shoulders. Or I can't move my pelvis and my sacrum. Or, or my hips or my thighs. Something. Um, or I've always had tight, tight hamstrings and I can't flex through my heels. These are kind of those buzzwords that I've just learned over time look at this you know this this might be like bells and whistles you mentioned that there are 10 clear steps or 10 sessions I'd love to hear what they are absolutely so Ida Ralph uh, in her in her uh, structural integration came up with 10 sessions I call them 10 sessions I almost rename them 10 intentions and here's how they flow session one two and three are bunched together And we call them the outer body sessions, meaning superficial, for lack of a better term. Picture, this might be dating me, picture a velour jumpsuit and that kind of uh, outer shell or maybe a wetsuit. We're trying to unpin that outer wetsuit in sessions one, two, and three. And specifically, session one begins with the shoulder girdle and the pelvis and the the diaphragm, the thoracic outlet. So that really is breathing. So session one begins with trying to have someone be able to move their shoulders and their pelvis in uniform to breathe. Very superficial, very, very, it can be quote unquote painful but very, very short lasting. This is not, this is not quote unquote a painful process. It's more, uh, it's more doing work. And the other thing, before I even get started talking about the rest of the sessions, is this is a very partnership work. Uh, the practitioners of structural integration don't do things to the patients or clients. They just anchor and facilitate movement. So nothing is done without 
the patient or client's permission. And what I love about this is it's empowering them to move. It's not me doing an adjustment that I always have to do. It's allowing someone to move through an area of their body that they might not be able to move through. So session one, outer core, uh, more the uh, shoulder girdle and the pelvis. Session two goes down into the lower legs and feet and making sure the arches are aligned and making sure the ankles are moving and making sure the, the tops and bottoms of the feet are transi trans transitioning energy to the ground. Uh, session three brings that back up the outer seam almost picture a pant seam on the legs and then a body seam on the side of the body. Again, paying attention to that outer jumpsuit. And that's actually an area for me that I've always been so tight. And when I was doing my triathlon training days, my ITB band down the side of my legs, that pantsuit stripe, would be excruciating. It still is. It's still extremely tight. So even just the lightest press of touch can send me flying on that side seam. So it's really interesting to see that that side of the body or the outer side of the body is addressed so early on. Absolutely. So in, in terms of the thinking of this work, you can't, you can't go deep. You can't move deeper structures until the outside is organized. It, it, for whatever reason, it almost short circuits the process. It, the organization has to go out to in, in terms of this work. And it's, it's almost hard to label it superficial because every stroke that we do together does so much. I mean, it's, it's such amazing work. Uh, but in terms of the thinking of the philosophy, this is the sessions and the intention. But yeah, you, you Rebecca, are very common with a lot of people that that area is just, whoa. Interestingly enough, from the naturopathic digestive side, those are actually points that correspond with the colon and the small intestine, depending on the side of the leg. So yes, and the hepatic flexure and the splenic flexure. So I love when different disciplines can kind of bring things together. It's also the gallbladder meridian and the liver meridian in Chinese medicine. So there's a lot of amazing, we, we could go, that'll, that'll be the next hour, but we could go on a lot about all that. But yeah, that's, that's done session three. Oh, that's so interesting. You know, I just love doing my podcast so much because I learn so much amazing stuff every time because I'm able to uh, pick the brains of all these incredible um, practitioners around the world and I just love it so much. And, I, and I'm just wondering, and this is a purely selfish question because I'm thinking about my, my own legs now. <laughs> The number of times I've had personal trainers say to me, oh, you've just got to roll it out, like get on those rolling things and roll it out. And literally, the moment I start putting pressure on them, on my legs, on those rolling things, it's like I have hot pokers burning up and down my legs and it's so painful. I don't want to do it because it hurts so much. Should we be rolling up and down on those hard foam rollers in an attempt to try and soften these tight ITB bands from, from a structural integration perspective? So you learn in medicine to never say always. Um, but let me just say, I've seen in the majority of cases, many of my patients say the same thing and it doesn't help. So when it can help is after it's been integrated. So th when notice that that process is in session three, there's been two intentions, two cycles of work that have been done before even that part is being quote unquote foam rolled. Um, so possibly it's just out of order in the sense of thinking from a structural integration standpoint. There's other structures impacting the tightness of that area that haven't been released yet. So in taking a foam roller or a tennis ball, or I've heard some very creative things to that area, it's just not ready to let go yet. The other parts, meaning the feet or the shoulders and pelvis, haven't moved first. So session one would be the pelvis and the shoulders. Session two would be the feet. Then you would deal with that outer seam. Yeah, and I'm just I'm sitting here going, I've got chronic neck and shoulder pain. I've got a really I've got bad feet because I've damaged my feet so much over the years. Uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's so much to do. 
<laughs> and I've got my ITB. What am I going to be feeling like by the end of this chat? I'll be like, okay, yeah. Jason, I'm moving to Portland <laughs> and you are doing many hours of structural integration work on me. One question I have um, is, let's say someone like me again, you know, selfish questions, where there is, um, you know, I've, I've injured my ankles uh, multiple times, severe injuries requiring crutches, extensive bruising, damage to ligaments and tendons. One injury was so bad it required me to be in a cast for six weeks and it was soft tissue damage, not, not bone damage. Do you find that you – can you? is it just one session where you're working on this one area of the body or if there's been significant – trauma or prolonged chronic injury can you find that you need to be at point two for several sessions um, before you can move through to point three the answer it's that's an excellent question rebecca the answer is actually a both and so that's why i kind of not to we always want to use the work of idol ralph and incorporate modern wisdom with it uh, that's why i called it an intention you know, in the sense of the intention would be to get some level of movement through your ankles, which have been injured. And quite honestly, all of us have been injured in some way. So at some point in these sessions, everyone's going to have one of those things that are touched upon. It won't necessarily, so the answer to your question is, it won't necessarily be quote unquote fixed after one session. And here's the, the, the truth of the matter. Our intention isn't to fix. Our intention is to create movement. So as long as that area has some level of movement, it is now on the trend line up towards health and integration. That may allow us to move through that session for now, but you are exactly correct. That may be a signal in the future. We need to go back here and spend some more time. I really like that reminder that it's an intention uh, to create movement rather than uh, a common thing that I think us Western cultures have is it's black and white, it's fixed or it's broken. So we've what's where do we get now at session four? So we've started with the shoulders and the pelvis and then the feet and ankles and then the side of the body, my pain points. <laughs> where do we go next? That's a good question, hey? I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We'll be back in a moment. Where do we get now at session four? So we've started with the shoulders and the pelvis and then the feet and ankles and then the side of the body, my pain points. <laughs> Where do we go next? So that brings us into what we would call the core sessions. So four, five, six, and seven are beginning to go into the inner core. And Dr. Ralph conceptualized an outer core and an inner core almost as cylinders that have to move together and integrate together. So the inner core begins with session four, which is actually the inner line. So we did the outer line in three. The session four is the inner line coming up into the pelvic floor. This is the point of the sessions where I squealed. <laughs> where this was tighter than tight. So um, yeah, that inner line is bringing, starting to address that inner core and movement. And interestingly enough, it comes from the ground up. So, you know, in the sense of moving through that, that movement into the feet, up into the pelvic floor and beginning to address that. Session five starts in the anterior abdomen. So all of those structures, pelvic floor, uh, the um, iliacus muscles, the psoas, the abdominal muscles, all of the uh, stuff 
in there and all the structures around it because fascia is, fascia is just encased around everything there. Uh, this, is, this is the intense part of the work and very much so four, five, and then six, which is the back of the abdomen, dealing with the lumbar spine, the first time we're going after the lumbar vertebrae and the quadratus lumborum, which is the muscles around the lumbar spine, just that back of the abdomen. Picture just that back bringing that up. This is the real core of the work for a lot of digestive distress, be it SIBO or Crohn's ulcerative colitis, in, uh, interstitial cystitis, all of these sorts of things. So a um, lot, of, lot of pelvic floor work for men here with prostate conditions and constipation and uh, just hip injuries. I mean, it has so many indications there's so much stuff in this area. And then four, five, six, seven is bringing it up into the head. We actually go into the mouth, into the floor of the mouth, into the upper mouth, into the nose, into the sinuses, moving the cranial bones, moving the sphenoid bone, which is right behind the eyes, uh, possibly even going into the ear canal, moving all of that and the neck and throat, um, in session seven, so completing that core in the head. And interestingly enough, this is why six and seven are at this point, we almost create the flow from the head through the pelvis. So it's almost like opening up, uh, unkinking a garden hose and letting water energy all flow from the head through the abdomen, through the thorax first, through the breathing apparatus, through the abdomen, through the pelvis. So it's kind of completing that core work, and that's where we're at at session seven. Wow, that's amazing. And, and I'm just thinking of uh, the work I've done with myself around the visceral mobilization. And I know the work that others do, which is where it's um, very focused on one point, generally the abdom abdominal area. Are we going about it all the wrong way when we're just focusing on these one areas? I, it, it's, I want to be careful here. I wouldn't say it's necessarily wrong. It could be a part of the journey. It could be a part of, you know, addressing one piece of the puzzle. But I do see it, on, honestly, as one piece of the puzzle because just from all this uh, learning and time and looking at things and asking these questions, I can't see the abdomen in itself or in it or adhesion in the abdomen separate from the pelvis, separate from the ability to breathe, separate from the ability of the shoulders to move and the head to move and the floor of the mouth to move and the pelvis to move and the feet to move. I can't see that as separate. It's almost, I, I think I'm ruined. So I'm ruined for that kind of, of, of looking at things that I would just see it as a piece of things and not necessarily judging it in the sense of it's wrong, but in the sense of it, it may just be a piece of the puzzle. I don't think it's ruined. I think it's enlightened. And I think that it's something that, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm forever seeking further enlighten enlightenment so that I can continue to evolve the way that I approach my body and the way I treat my body and try and heal my body rather than just looking at things in isolation like I did when I first got diagnosed and all I thought about was my small intestine and the little critters that were <laughs> living unwelcomely <laughs> in my small intestine. <laughs> so at session seven, you're in the head and yes. it's making me think of times when I've seen uh, osteopaths in Melbourne and I'll often, I get very tight uh, jaw, a very tight jaw. Uh, I clench and grind my teeth at night time and I get quite sore necks and, and on, on occasion they'll get into my mouth and really start to press on some of those muscles and oh my gosh, that is intense. That's pretty strong uh, because those muscles are tight. They're really tight. Um, where to from there? Like you obviously you've gone into the head. Yes. So we've we've kind that, of opened the channel. Exactly. So in terms of the intentions of the sessions, this has gotten through each piece. So by session seven, we've probably touched upon most parts of the body in some way, shape, or form. Sessions eight, nine, and ten are what we call the integration sessions. Session eight and nine, we are kind of a couple. You can't 
You can't kind of take them apart. And they're either lower or upper body. And at this point, because we've gotten the fascial network moving and we've gotten movement through each of these pieces, we start looking at organizing it and integrating it to gravity. So the, the ultimate goal is to balance and center someone to gravity because we have to be earth movers, earth dwellers. That's what we need to be better at. We need to take this force of gravity and be able to move with it rather than against it or fight against it. So session eight and nine are either upper or lower, and we start to look at what we would call hinges. So organizing the hinges, which are the ankles, the knees, the pelvis, the dorsal hinge, which is probably the solar plexus right in the middle, the shoulders, uh, and then the occiput, sphenoid, cranial base, so in the, in the middle of the head. These things, almost like strings on a puppet, we want moving together and integrated. And that shows a high level of integration in the body if these things can all move in concert. And that's the important part, and that's why it ends with these 8, 9, and 10, is it must be integrated. Movement by itself is not organized. It's a sign of life. It's going in the right way, because if we don't move, we die. But it's not integrated yet. And 8, 9, and 10 take the time to take each person's individual body and take the time to organize their structures very individual to them. So either eight or nine will be an upper and lower session, and then session 10, the graduation or the completion, is going up the front and down the back. So in a very, very organized fashion, organizing energy in the body, movement in the body through these, through these joints, through these hinges, and allowing that to move. Really, it's the flow of breath. It's the flow of life. And... Um, I call session 10 kind of the in-between session because it's everything. So yes, it's a graduation, but it's also a new beginning. And what happens then? Are you uh, fixed, for want of a better word? Are you then requiring maintenance? How how do you then move on? <laughs> that There's probably is, no yeah, one that, simple yes, answer. <laughs> that, is a, that is the answer for the ages. Um, it literally is patient-specific. So the intention, let me be honest here, though. The intention of the 10 sessions is to be complete. So in the sense of this work once done will change someone forever. And I, I will never use the term fixed, so I'm sorry. I can't do it. Um, but the movement that we've gotten will begin a process that will not end. So could there be further work? Absolutely. I and Dr. Ralph view them as octaves, almost on like a keyboard. Like the 10 sessions are one octave, and then you can move on. Um, some people are done. You know, this, this is probably a great time to start talking about the intensity of this work. This is intense on both the practitioner and the patient. We're literally moving through not only the body, but also the mind and spirit and things that might have been stored that might just not be an injury. It might not just be a motor vehicle accident or a, a broken ankle or a torn ligament or, or whatnot. It could also be trauma emotional, spiritual. It could also be abuse, emotional, spiritual, um, that the body just remembers in a certain section. And what I love about this work, I am also a trained counselor, but what I love about this work is sometimes you don't even need to talk about it. Sometimes you both just acknowledge it's there, you know it's coming up, there might be some tears, but it just moves through. And that's, that's the beauty of this. So in answer to your question, it's a new beginning. It could be the end, for, for many people, it could be enough to bring them to a place that they're moving through enough. For other people, uh, there might be stuff that they want to revisit. I have plenty of patients that are like, can we do four again? <laughs> that really, that really did something. And, you know, it's, it's just a journey. And, you know, we're just all trying to learn and walk it together. Mm. And one of my questions was going to be around emotional memory in fascia um, and the body and one of the experiences that I had when I did my first session with Alyssa Tate uh, with my visceral mobilization uh, she was doing some work on my abdomen and pressed just 
somewhere. I couldn't even tell you where now. And I was flooded with um, emotion, emotional memory from the sexual abuse from my childhood. And I'd, I hadn't even thought about the fact that she may well uh, touch on some areas that were emotional storage or blocks uh, before I um, started working with her. And, and I was in floods of tears while she worked through that particular point. And, and I was saying, oh, my gosh, Alyssa, I don't even know why I'm sobbing. And she said, well, that's fine. And, you know, the, the tears are fine. Just You just let it out. Let, you let it come out. And as soon as she'd released that area, the tears stopped instantly. It was like night and day, a light switch being turned on and off. And I was fine. It was a really interesting experience. And and uh, at the end, I said, wow, that was that was." pretty intense but I feel really good for it I feel great for the release um, and something that I, I've now realized uh, because you know I'm on this constant quest to improve my health and learn so much about the human body uh, when I first started dealing with the trauma or the abuse I started with a psychologist which I think is a very common place for people to start because I think it's head it's brain it's memories I'll go there uh, when we did some pretty deep therapy work around some of my memories, uh, my therapist would say, where do you feel it in your body? And I always felt it in my gut. And I'm sure if I went back in time and asked myself, where specifically in your gut do you feel it? I would probably point to that location where Alyssa touched and I then had floods of tears. And it wasn't until after that session with Alyssa that I walked away and thought, wow, oh my gosh, like my body's had it there this whole time. Uh, I haven't chosen to tune into it really other than, you know, a psychology session in the past. Um, but my gosh, like that trauma is just hanging out in my fascia, in my body um, as a memory of what I've gone through uh, that I'm not consciously aware of at all until work gets done on that area. Do you see that um, happening with your patients? Absolutely. And not every patient. See, this is the other thing is for some patients, that's a very common thing to happen. And it's amazing. And you can't, there's no other way to do that. A foam roller is not going to do that on your fascia. Um, it, it's, it's, that, it's that connection of practitioner and patient or client and that transference of energy, whatever that might be, that just allows that space to happen. And, you know, like, like we both said, words didn't have to be said. They, they didn't have to be spoken. It just happened. And that's the beauty of this work. So yes, um, the body remembers. It really does. The more I look at this, the more I see, the more I see thing, more and more things like this that you don't know until you get to that place that, wow, that was that spot that was stuck. And that spot may open up a whole other Pandora's box that now you can move through, but it's that trend line up. It's that, it's that integration towards movement. It's the, it's the symptoms, some of them are better. Others may get worse for a little bit, but everything, the trajectory is positive. The trajectory is a more integrated, healthy, moving human being. Something I have people say to me uh, reasonably frequently because I'm so open now about my whole experience with life, uh, which is such a contrast because back in the day I was so closed and terrified for anybody to know that I had ever been sexually abused or gone through horrific bullying or anything like that. Um, people now say to me, I don't want to deal with it. You know, if you told me that by having some physical therapy or some structural integration that I may have to face the emotional trauma of my past, I don't want to do it. I, I'm too scared by that. I, I've closed that off purposefully because I don't have the energy or the strength to go back to it. And they say, how do you do it? And I say, well, I'm ready for it. I want to move forward and through it because I don't want to stay stuck where I was. And I think 
uh, touching on what you've said before around movement. Movement is life and stagnation is not. And for me, it's been so important to move forward, have that positive trend line. But for someone that might be thinking, oh my gosh, I might have to deal with emotional baggage. Oh, how do you how do you talk to them about that? Is this the right thing for them at that moment in time? Maybe not. Maybe not. And, you know, it's you have to respect everyone's process and their wishes. And, um, you know, the great thing about being a naturopathic physician is we have a lot of tools. This is just one. And I warn every practitioner to not, if you have a hammer, don't see everything as a nail. And maybe it's just not the time to hit that nail either. It might just, it might be a nail. You might have the tool, but it might not be time to use it, which is what you're reflecting upon now. And to be honest, I have some patients that go through session one, two, and three, and they're done. And that's okay. You know, that's in, in taking, when I said the intention, the intention also of session one, two, and three is to bring down the mask. So, you know, it's the external jumpsuit. It's our external component. You can't get into the core together and move through it if you're not letting that down. So, um, and that's, some with some patients, we just do session one, two, and three over and over and over and over again. And does it help them? Absolutely. They're not constipated. So... You know, but, you know, you just meet people where they are and it doesn't have to be talked about. It will not ever be judged in this office. Absolutely not. Um, You know, you just meet people where they are and you walk, you help them walk where they are, where they want to choose. And it's not that you're constantly, you're constantly wanting better for them, but you're not forcing them to go where they just don't want to go. You know, walk with them where they want to and bring them to the best possible place they could be at that moment. And if they're ready, then they move through it. If not, maybe that's just not something to be moved through either. Mm, That's, I think, an important point. Maybe you don't have to move through it. Maybe you don't have to be like me and want to move through everything. (laughs) But that's, that's actually my style. I've been bulldozing my way through life since the day I was born, two months premature, really. We are all beautifully individual. Oh, yeah. we are. But what I will say about doing this is that, yes, there are times when uh, I have done work on my trauma, which I locked away for so many years, and it's it was hard. I will not lie. It was hard. But I am. I feel so much better for it today than I did 10 years ago when it was my deep, dark secret and it only came out when I was self-medicating with drugs and alcohol and then my poor friends had to deal with me when I was, uh, you know, wasted and not coping and the emotional trauma would spill out because it had to go somewhere. So it, it can be really scary um, taking that first step and I think it's important to find the right practitioner or practitioners and not just start this process with someone that doesn't feel right. And I think this goes for all practitioners, just not someone that's just dealing with you with a trauma, but all health practitioners. If you walk into the office or the clinic of a practitioner and you don't get the, a great vibe from them or you just feel a bit off, listen to your intuition, listen to what your body's saying. They might not be the right person for you, despite the fact they might have amazing reviews on Google or everyone says they're the best doctor you should go and see. If if they're not the right person for you, that it's not going to be an easy process to move forward towards health. And I now take my practitioners really seriously because I see them as part of my team. And I want people that I like, respect and trust on my team, not people that I feel a bit odd around. I would completely agree. I, I couldn't I couldn't say that better in the sense of, you know, especially with this work, you really want to be able to partner with someone, um, someone that you would, you feel could hold you in that space that you might not be able to be held right now. And again, maybe that's not verbal. It could be but maybe it isn't and definitely listen to that sense from the practitioner and the clinic owner side. I would say have some grace too. people could have an off day, but 
that that aside, uh, always pay attention to that inner voice. Um, I w- everything we're talking about today is talking about allowing that to be empowered and moving. So of course, be listening to it. Mm. And um, yeah, I feel like this is uh, a new way. I feel that this is, could be the new way of the future in terms of our uh, holistic health approach. Uh, it's, uh, I'm sure, a very novel way of thinking for some people. Some people b- might be listening to this episode thinking, I have never thought about my feet as having any correlation to my gut. Um, do you see this as where we're going in the future with our health care? I would hope so. I'll answer it that way. I would hope so in the sense that some some view of the body as a whole that there isn't there aren't these pieces that are just excess or um, that that the feet not being able to move as the foundation of movement of walking would not would not affect the whole system you know so organ some level of coming to a place that medicine can treat and organize the whole body I mean that this is why after multiple professions, I came to naturopathic medicine. This is what I truly believe in. And structural integration isn't the only system of thought thinking this way, even though I love its view of fascia and I think it is novel and a wave of the future. And there's going to be more studies there are right now showing that this is what we need to be doing. Uh, but, you know, homeopathy, acupuncture, the classical acupuncture, these sorts of things address this fascial body, this interstitium, this wholeness as well. And there could be pieces of that. Even psychotherapy and counseling and these sorts of things can help move things through. But again, let me touch upon just counseling or psychotherapy, like you said, is just the head. It's not moving it through the body. You know, those two things together, both and, are where the power is. If somebody's thinking structural integration sounds like something I need to include in my um, kit bag of all things I'm doing to regain my health, how does one go about finding someone that knows about structural integration? Is there a qualification that someone would have to have in order to practice this? Absolutely. So there is a board. The IASI is the integration, the International Association of Structural Integrators. This is a board certification that certifies structural integrators. Uh, not every structural integrator gets that because it's a separate license. For instance, I don't have it, but I was I was a graduate of one of their schools. So that could be a f- place to start. In, in looking at things. Um, it, use Eight Hearts as a resource in the sense of we actually have partnered with a school for structural integration, so we're actually training future practitioners and, and to actually do this work, to get more people out in the field uh, thinking this way and looking through this lens. Uh, but definitely the board certification would be a place. Um, the Ralph Institute uh, based in Colorado is a great place to get a lot of research. Um, there's just uh, Anatomy Trains by Thomas Myers is a book written on kind of this fascial plane type of stuff. There's there's a bunch of, of things to do, and there's a lot of uh, structural integration practitioners. Uh, some are certified Ralphers. Um, some are just uh, board certified by structural integration. But like we touched upon before, it's really finding the partnership. It's finding a practitioner that you feel uh, understands where you are and can help you move through uh, what's going on. So, Dr. Jason Wysocki, thank you so much for coming on to the Healthy Gut Podcast and sharing your knowledge around this. As you know, <laughs> from what, how we've been talking today, I have learned so much. Um, if people would like to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do so? Best way is to get in touch uh, with us at Eight Hearts. Uh, I practice at Eight Hearts Health and Wellness. Eighthearts.org is our website, and all of our fantastic practitioners are on there. And I see patients in Portland, Oregon. I do distance consultations, and we're currently working on possibly some travel type of things to help people. So keep in touch with us. Keep following us um, to get more of what my new journey is. Wonderful. And those links are in the show notes today. So thank you once again, Dr. Wysocki, for coming onto the podcast. As always, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. 
It's an absolute joy, Rebecca. Thanks for coming again in our new SI room. <laughs> I know it's wonderful here here in Portland doing this face to face. It's so it's so great. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Thank you. hope you enjoyed today's interview with Dr. Jason Wysocki. I love sitting down and chatting with him, which I'm sure you can hear in the interview. To grab the show notes from today's episode or to join up as a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast so you can get the transcription absolutely free, head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast and you'll be able to see today's interview, all my other interviews, and you can join the Healthy Gut Podcast membership. Do come say hi on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, and Google+. I just love hearing from you. So look for us under the Healthy Gut. And it would mean the absolute world to me if you could leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or the platform you use to listen to this podcast. It helps me know if I am giving you the interviews that you really want to hear and it helps other people with SIBO to know that this is the right SIBO podcast for them. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening.